evening canvas it is i kieran and today we are going to discuss the 1976 man booker winner david stories savile it i didn't know i'm gonna win that spoiler actually. if you are a dedicated camper you will know that i was going to be reading this book because you chose it so again if you're not on my instagram head over and follow and you can decide the fate of every booker winner i will read though so i buddy read this book with the lovely the wonderful the magnificent karen from run right reads now if you're not following karen get get over there get over there right now because like myself she's doing the same project she's going to read every single man book a winner so if you're interested in my takes on these books you will definitely be interested in her takes because we have very different opinions on this book, so so check it out. It will be linked down below. Not wanting to repeat myself, this one for 1976 man booker. Now, if you go online, type in David Story Savile, you don't get you don't get much. Even if you Wikipedia this book, all you get is that it won the man booker in 1976. There is so little about this. Book. It fed into the reason why I didn't actually want to pick up this 647 page beast because I knew nothing about it. But I did the work for you. So what is Savile about? Simply, it is about the Savile family and their life in a small mining community in Saxton. So we start this story with Savile and his wife Ellen at their little child Andrew moving into a house in Saxton. The reason being there's a colliery and as Savile is a miner he needs to move for the work. They are salt of the earth working class. They have nothing to their name. Everything they have is because they earned it. That modern want of having money to be prosperous, to be able to provide for your family beyond your days is a complete ideal for the Savills. All they care about is their little family. Them three. That's all they have, that's all they want, and it's all they need. The joy that Savile gets from seeing his little boy Andrew pitter patter through this dilapidated house, you start ignoring the surroundings completely and you focus on this pure blossoming love that only a father and a mother can have for their child. David's story, however, completely rips your heart out as in one night, Andrew dies. The news of the child's death is deafening. There's no real emotion within those pages. It's sparse. It's very matter of fact. And Savile keeps his emotions where he keeps his work underground. Through the rest of the pages, not only do we see Savile's deterioration because of the physical strain of hard labor working underground for long periods of time to support his family, we also see the emotional strain. Nothing is ever spoken about until very later in the novel, about 20 years later. It's worth mentioning that in the background, World War II is going on but one boy's life causes more damage than the entire Blitz could imagine. A stable marriage is obliterated. Every foundation the Savile has built his life upon now is cracked at the seams. And you could feel his fingernails dragging whilst he's been thrown into the abyss of mourning, of grief of trying to understand why his son died. In these 74 pages, David's story has set out the context of what is to come. A what is to come is a who. And who is it? It's the second child, Colin Savile. Colin is now the central character and we see him grow up, experience childhood, the friendships that he has, his school days, his career, and what it is to grow up. Colin is a shy and introverted child and he's very much pressurized 
by his father to be the best that he possibly can. That dream of money, prosperity and be able to provide for your family is forced on Colin from a very, very young age. For what Andrew could never achieve, Colin will need to achieve. Savile is therefore over the moon when Colin completes an exam which will decide what school he will end up going to, which is one of the best schools in Yorkshire. Being the best school will come to the assumption that money is involved in some way, shape or form. And coming from an utterly poor working class background, we see Colin go to school with middle class kids. David's story can write a British school scene flawlessly and make it come to life. Even down to the mannerisms of the teachers, like I could place like in my school and how the pupils like bounce off each other, like bicker and gossip. It was, it was incredible. So if you've been to a British school, even just to pick this book up to read those scenes alone, would be worth its weight in gold. And if you've never been to a British school and want to know like what it's like, David's story hands down does the best job. I, I, ha I have to give him that. I have to give him that. Despite what school you went to, you know that there was that one pupil who tried so hard to please a teacher and they just fall on their face most of the time and Colin is this kid. Oh, you, your equal part wincing of the embarrassment, but you have to agree with the teacher completely mocking and undermining him because Colin does not help himself in these situations. In one English class with the strictest teacher ever, he has to answer the question of to explain imagery in one poem. And Colin, oh, for the love of God, why did you do it? He writes his answer. <laughs> That's like a William Wordsworth inspired prose. And he's got vows in it. He's got doths and all this flowery image. And the teacher just rips him in front of a class full of boys and Everyone is eating it up. So much so they call him the bard for like the remainder of the class. And the scene itself is like 20 pages long. And you just feel, oh, the sheer embarrassment that Colin is going through. Like he can't dig himself out because he, he did it. Oh. It's written so well. It's done so well. Like, honestly, you could just tell someone who hasn't read this book, this story, and just make up names and just use your actual school, and they would believe you, because there's so much, like, depth and detail that you know that Colin was just talked about. Like, even in his adulthood, it would be that one story where they go, oh, Colin Savile, remember the bard? It's great. Yeah, Colin doesn't really do well in school. He's not particularly liked, but there is one kid who he gets on with very well, which is Stafford, who is the complete antithesis. Yeah, Colin doesn't do well in school and doesn't have that many friends. However, he has one friend, Stafford, who is the complete antithesis of everything that Colin is. Whereas the Savills are struggling for money and have to have manual paid jobs, the Staffords own a huge business and money is not a worry to them. Then you can see that Colin projects everything onto Stafford. Like everything that Stafford is, Colin wants. Stafford's like a really nice kid. He doesn't actually see Savile as just this working class kid who managed to get into school. They truly are friends, so much so that the interactions, you can really see the tension between the classes where they don't quite get on in some ways. His working class ways extrapolate into his relationships. For one girl that he's intimate with, they have this real debate about should women have more rights? 
as I will come from a working class background where his mum and no other woman works, he doesn't see why women want the rights. And it's not that he's being rude or misogynistic, sexist, it's more so he doesn't understand why women would want to go through the same thing as his men. Seeing his father becoming dilapidated through years of hard labour down the pits, why would anyone want to go through that? With age comes a little bit of wisdom and also comes a little bit of maturity. And Colin really is trying to figure out why is he the way he is. More so, in fact, is why is he being the way he is. And he pinpoints it all on his father. This is, this is where I start not liking the book. Because during this time, there's been two other sons who were born. And we don't actually follow them growing up. Just like war, we truly only focus on Colin for the remaining 600 pages. Therefore, it's really difficult when Colin's having these arguments with his father, saying, why are Richard and Andrew being able to do what they want? Are they not pressurised to be in the best school? Are they can live their life in whatever way they want? But we haven't followed them in any way, shape or form. Just like World War II, everything's very much a glimmer in the background. And it feels really purposeful. And when David Story brings up Andrew's death really later on in the novel, there's a moment where you go, why haven't we heard about this? We see Andrew's death. We see Colin Savile grow up. Why have the other sons not been a focus? Remember the title of this book is Savile, it's the entire family. At times in the story, things seem to be mentioned at the precise time because David's story needs to talk about that rather than he wants to talk about that. Yet as I say that, it makes complete sense for Colin to not know what happens to his friends as he grows up and mixes in different social circles. I don't feel that a 300 page gap justifies story dropping people's names about events that I was meant to remember. As this was a buddy reader, I had a message once going, who is Richard? I actually don't know who this character is. Why are we talking about him? It's the youngest son. Colin lives with his mum, dad and the two brothers. I do not see why there's so little of the family at times. It feels as though David's story is trying to do something here and make Colin as solipsistic as he possibly is. I just don't think it's executed well. The family story, though ignored through Colin's school days and his adolescence into adulthood, the last 50 pages is when the family really comes at the forefront where Colin is butting heads with everyone's ideas of what he should do. Savile has been alone throughout the majority of this story and he's trudging through trying to find an answer to what is life going to be for him. Though this novel is a look into the life of Colin and we see him grow up and there's always a question of what is he going to do and how is he going to change and what is going to be the outcome of Colin. It wants you to look into the future. But truly, this is a book about the past. It's saying it doesn't matter what you want to do. It's all about where you come from. And you can never change that. It's a beautiful message. Yeah, I don't think it was executed well. For me, this is a six out of ten. When this book shines, it shines. And when it gets things right, it's divine. But like the mining town, it's covered in soot and ash. And there's so much work to scrub all that away. Before I forget, you lovely people voted on an Instagram poll to figure out what man booker will I be reading next. And I'm also going to be doing it as a buddy read with Run Right Reads. And you have decided on Staying On by Paul Scott, which was the 1977 Man Booker winner. So it's literally the next one on 
from Savile. And doesn't that make everyone feel great? It makes me feel great. It makes you feel great. We're all great. Bye.